Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Why Do You Believe? And this is where I talk to people that have a contrary position to my own, and I try to see how reasonable that is and whether those people can be reasoned with. Today, I'm talking with Joshua, who identifies as a presuppositional apologist, both of which I have problems with, both words, I mean. Uh, Joshua, how are you doing? What do you got to say? Well, not bad. How are you? It's all right. It's all right. Still kicking. So, Describe, and, uh, and if you would, you know, it would just describe presuppositional apologists or um, apologetics. Well, I would describe uh, presuppositional apologetics as a method that takes aim at a person's presuppositions. Um, yeah, there's, there's nothing really, I mean, there's a whole lot more that could be said about that, but if, uh, just to sum it up really quickly, I mean, that's basically what it is. We don't. We don't argue so much over evidence, um, though we can certainly make appeals to evidence in a certain context. Um, but we do not. Uh, so, if your if your preconceived belief system maintained that you know that, uh, that, that this island that you're landing on uh, has never had you know that, that, that you're the first person that's ever been there, there's never been another person on this island. And as soon as you land your boat, you see the footprints of shoes bearing the name Nike. And you, you see the impression, you know, says Nike right there in the footprint, and you're, and you're wearing Adidas. Mm -hmm. Do you discard that in favor of your presupposition? Because your presupposition is that nobody's ever been to this island until you. No, I wouldn't discard that. Um, okay, so evidence does matter then. It does matter to uh, to a certain extent. I, I would I would say that presuppositions can be changed. At least some can. Others can't. Okay. Actually, maybe maybe we'll say that they all can. Um, but you'd have to give up rationality, I think, to give up some presuppositions, like the laws of logic, for example. I mean, you could you could totally deny that those are um, any criterion by which you should reason um, but you know you could deny that as a presupposition but it's going to lead to absurd consequences yeah well likewise you know we have to we have to assume that our our senses at least give us some conception of the reality around us or that what we perceive is to some degree real or that we uh, do we have some accuracy in our perception of that reality I mean even even uh, David Hume argued that everybody you know uh, theist or, or rationalist alike has to make this assumption because it's the only thing that actually works that if you if you don't assume that there's some truth to what you perceive as reality then you literally cannot function in any capacity so we do we can reasonably presuppose our own existence and that you know that then that the universe isn't a product of our own mind that there are other minds independent of our own because that's the only thing that is a, you know, that's the only thing that works sure. so i mean but beyond that i i don't make presuppositions so i'm uh, and and neither would i do apologetics mm -hmm. a, and i may have a different perception of both of those words than you do my objection to apologetics is the way that it's been spelled out in so many creationist organizations they post a statement of faith wherein they admit uh, paraphrasing it, you know, they phrase it different ways, but they admit that no amount of evidence will ever change their minds, that no matter how true the, the truth really is, no amount of proof will ever convince them that they will and must defend their position even if it has been proven wrong, that they can never concede any critical point, which means that it is a completely dishonest position. Well, let me kind of go through a few um, well let, let me kind of explain to you how I'm, how I'm approaching this conversation as okay. a presuppositionalist um, you and I both have different starting points for our network of presuppositions for our worldviews um, I stand on the authority of scripture as my ultimate criteria as my ultimate standard um, by which I interpret reality um, basically I view reality through the lens of what scripture has to say um, you, on the other hand, I'm sure we're going to get into it a little bit here, but um, let's say that your ability to reason rationally, or your own reasoning, for example, is your ultimate standard by which you approach reality. 
um, you might have some commitments. Uh, you might be committed to naturalism. Uh, I think in our little our brief. Well, then that, that goes against what I just told you about my position. I don't have any commitments. Are you what? Okay, well, I think you do have commitments, and we'll go through that. I mean, I'm sure you Okay, what commitments do you imagine that I have? I would imagine that you're committed to rational, well, rational discourse in this discussion. Okay, that, uh, that I would be prohibited from saying things that are apparently insane. Yeah, we can go with that. And then okay. what, what you and I would judge to be insane is really where the rubber hits the boat. And as a okay. presuppositionalist, what I, I do is push the antithesis between our two worldviews. Okay, well, see, I don't look at it as having, I don't have a worldview so much. I mean, that's that's not how I see it. I mean, I, I see that there are rules that apply to me that, that do not apply to believers. For okay. example, I cannot assert empty, baseless speculation as though that were fact. Because if you're stating facts that are not facts, if you're claiming knowledge that you don't actually know, in either case, those are lies. Mm -hmm. So I have a commitment to understanding and improving that understanding. That means that my, my, my information must be accurate or as accurate as possible. And, I'm, and therefore, I'm not going to state or assert anything as being true that I, unless I can show that it's true. I'm not going to say that I know something unless I can show that I know it. Okay. Are you... Is your epistemology based on what you could show? Pretty much, yes, because I, I understand that um, that memory is highly questionable, and we, and our our I remember things vividly that uh, that when I I've, I've had them objectively verified by other people who were there at the time, I find out that I many times I've remembered things differently than the other people did. Right. So I mean, and sometimes it's trivial, but you know it it. it that, that can matter sometimes if you're giving a personal account of the way you remember it. So one of the most irritating things that I ever hear from believers is when they say, oh, I know for a fact, you know, well, no, you don't. Because if you can't demonstrate your knowledge to any degree at all, by any means whatsoever, then you don't know it. And uh, a fact is a point of data that is objectively verifiable. So if you can't, if you can't show that you know it and you can't verify that it's true, then you certainly don't know it for a fact. It just means that you're thoroughly convinced you're, are you basically an empiricist? You do cling to empiricism as, I, as a philosophy for I, I don't I don't harshly put myself either in rationalism or empiricism. Okay. I mean, I, I identify primarily as a rationalist, but I I, I realize that uh, that personal experience um, is that there there are reasons there there are points of rationality that can ex that can exceed personal experience, but then I also have to bow to empirical evidence. Okay. But you would, you would agree that everything that you come to know, you know through your senses and through your reasoning, through the combination of those two. Well, the only thing that I know about, I mean, I can you go for objective verification, but again, we have to imagine that, uh, you know, that, that we're not living in a matrix, that, you know, that what I perceive to be reality really is reality, you know, and there's no reason to believe otherwise. Mm -hmm. So, a possibility that we could be in the matrix? Or not something? really, no. In order to say that there's a possibility, you have to show, you, you can't just say that anything is possible. You have to show that such possibility exists. Like, mm -hmm. for example, and I got into this with a physicist once upon a time who, who uh, insisted he would never say that anything was not possible, but he famously said that, the, that having a soul is impossible. He just didn't use the word impossible. He said, we know for this and this reason that this does not exist, but he wouldn't, but in the way the news media repeated it was that he said it was impossible, but he refused to use that word, which I think is funny. So if I told him, and I think this was part of the conversation we had, I said, is it possible for a cow to jump over the moon, like in the old, you know, uh, storybook rhyme? And he says, well, that's very highly unlikely. And I say, no. We know the, the number, we, we know that the speed of velocity, you know, the escape velocity and the, the length of the cow's legs, the amount of muscle, the amount of weight, we can do all the math we want to, and there is no way we could ever calculate this where a cow has any chance at all of going over the moon. So we, we can safely say that it is impossible for a cow to jump over the moon. He just, he just wouldn't say that word, and I don't know what is, what is issue with that was, but I mean, if, if the math cannot possibly work out ever, then there is no possibility. So you have to show that such a possibility exists. 
And so there has to be a precedent or a parallel or a verified phenomenon whereby you can show that such a possibility exists. And when people say, well, you can't, uh, you can't uh, disprove magic, and by magic I mean anything supernatural, sure. uh, you know, I say, okay, well, fine. If, if it were that magic really existed, then, then Spock could come and do his mind meld, and Obi-Wan Kenobi could come and do the things that he does, and, and, and Gandalf could come and do the things that, and they would all be able to demonstrate this. You know, under repeatable conditions, and even James Randi would be satisfied that even if we can't explain what it was that they did, we can at least verify that they did it. Mm -hmm. And so there is a there is a demonstrable phenomenon at work there. But what we have with with all things supernatural is that we they've given the wrong answer absolutely every time. That there's never been one time when the supernatural answer turned out to be right, but there's thousands of times that it has been proven to be wrong. So it's a, it's a perpetual failure situation. And then everything that they propose is both logically and evidently false. I mean, not, not possible at all, but I understand. Okay. So just kind of going over some of the stuff that you said there. I mean, you, you sound like an empiricist. Um, you know, to, to basically you, you do rely upon your ability to reason you you rely upon the reliability of your senses in order to come to knowledge about reality and my question but an empiricist wouldn't accept that uh that there can be rational arguments that are uh, not necessarily evident and i will accept that there could be a rational argument that that could be something for for, for which we don't have evidence or at least that doesn't contradict the evidence we already have so if you want to call me an empiricist call me an empiricist that's fine I'm just saying you sound like one. You may not be one. I'm just listening to what you're saying, and it, um, you know, it sounds like you want things to be. See, I've never actually, you know, established where I am philo uh, philosophically as far as the label goes. Uh, yeah. Some people, because you know, when I start talking about the, necess the necessity of empirical evidence, then they want to put me in a box like uh, that. I'm a logical positivist, and and that was that was dismissed a generation ago. And those very people who tell me that logical positive, who identify me as, although I didn't identify as, they identify me as a logical positivist, and then tell me that that fell out of fashion in the late 20th century. And then they go on to cite some other philosopher from the 1300s who was himself refuted in the 1800s. Mm -hmm. and, so, and so why are they refuting something that, 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 that they identify to on me or pin on me from the 1900s? It is a, the frustrating thing about philosophy is, you know, one, there's no objective verification. There's no way to say, well, that guy was wrong, and we move on to this guy. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I could still, if, if I wanted to, if I wanted to identify as a logical positivist, which I never did, but if I did identify as a logical positivist, I'm just as, just as justified in defending them as the people that are, that are citing Aquinas. Okay. going through my notes here. I did a little research on you, by the way. I had no idea that you uh, came from a Mormon background. I thought that was pretty interesting. Yeah, I didn't um, and, you, know, you toy with this philosophy, too. I never identified as a Mormon. I was baptized as a Mormon, mm -hmm. but I never identified as one. I, I, when I was uh, baptismal age, I lived in an exclusively Mormon community where absolutely everybody was Mormon, you know, unless they were brown. Then they were Catholic. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, that's that's where we lived. And then we moved to Los Angeles and I got to experience, you know, a mix of different cultures and such. And so I realized there's a bunch of different religions and people would ask me, what is your religion? And that I, I realized right away when everybody, when anybody asked me that question, I knew that there was going to be a problem. One, if you care what my religion is, I already know we're going we're to have issues. Mm -hmm. But secondly, I would say that my family is Mormon. And it, there would be an obvious comma there, but I never get to say the but. And it would start telling me the crazy things that Mormons believe. And very often it would be crazy things that Mormons don't believe. Not that Mormons don't believe crazy things, but they'd be telling me the wrong crazy things. And so I would tell them, you know, why you, you want to come into my house and tell my mother that she believes all these things? And of course, they always refuse that invitation, which tells me that they know that they're full of shit. Mm -hmm. So if you want to know what a Mormon believes, you ask a Mormon. You don't ask a Southern Baptist. If you want to know what anybody believes, you don't ask a Southern Baptist. If you want to know what a Southern Baptist believes, you ask 200 Southern Baptists, and you'll get, probably get 200 different answers. Mm -hmm. 
Well, our, our agreed upon... Oh, I, I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't finish that statement. I never identified as Mormon because how would I know at that young age uh, mm -hmm. if I believed everything that was necessary to be a Mormon? Because a Mormon has a whole set of beliefs. How would I know that I believe everything required? And how would I know, without studying all these other religions, that there wasn't another religion that might suit with me better or that would make more sense to me? So... Mm -hmm. At, at, at eight or nine years old, I'm thinking, I can't identify as a Mormon because I don't know if I'm Mormon. And I, I'm shocked that I seem to be the only child that came to that conclusion. Because shouldn't that be what everybody says? Mm -hmm. That nobody would adopt any religion until they've studied a plethora of them to know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I know what you're saying. I kind of grew up in a... Uh in a situation where I was exposed a lot to uh, the charismatic stuff. So, you know, that, of course, caused some issues for me growing up. Yeah. But um, going through my notes here, and uh, the, the topic that you and I agreed upon for this discussion would be which worldview provides the preconditions for intelligible experience. Okay. Uh, those being the laws of logic, moral absolutes, um, you know, uniformity in nature, reliability of senses and memory. And we don't have to discuss all of those because I think it would be a long night to cover all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd just so like to know, I mean, when we're talking about pre, uh, presuppositions, we, we, we talked about, you know, the perception of reality as being real, that we have some idea that our senses are providing us with that. And now that's a presupposition. That's something that you, you've come to that conclusion before you ever thought about it. And you're talking about something, you're, you're talking about a form of apologetics that likely didn't exist when you were born, so it wasn't really a presupposition. You chose to adopt this. So why did you, why did you subsequently adopt what you're calling a presupposition? In other words, why, I, and I'm assuming that the presupposition was, it wasn't that the way you described it, that your presupposition is that the Bible is true? Well, we start with scripture as our ultimate criteria, our ultimate standard. Okay. How is that possible? Everybody, well, I'll, I'll get into that in a little bit. I'm, I'm just making the statement that, that everybody has a worldview. And if you deny that you have a worldview, then that's just a part of your worldview. It's, it's hard to escape having a worldview. Well, you, you're talking about commitments. And, and I mentioned earlier having a commitment to a position that you're going to defend that position no matter what. Now, if, if my position is that I want to improve my understanding of reality as it is, then it doesn't matter what you believe. All that matters is why you believe it, right? What is well, the reason behind the belief? Your worldview is going to tell you how to determine, or sorry, tell you how to interpret what's real. I mean, you and I are, are looking at the world through, um, you know, opposite ends of the spectrum here. I mean, I'm a biblical are we? Christian. You're, you know... You know, whatever you are, you're definitely an atheist. Um, uh, you know, it's just... We're, we're both okay, so again, if, if we don't have a faith-based situation, I mean, I, I, I primarily identify as an epistemist, which means that I object to faith as being the most dishonest position it is possible to have. Okay, so I, if you want to talk that. about a worldview, then my worldview would, be, worldview would be to get as far away from faith as possible, that any belief that requires faith should be rejected for that reason. Okay. Um, do you have faith that your senses reliably convey what's real to you? No, I have evidence of that. That's in what you're doing now is a equivocation where you're taking the colloquial definition of faith being a synonym of trust and putting that as though it were the same meaning as the religious context of faith, which is a belief for which there is no evidence. Well, I nice. never I never say that I have faith in anything because I don't like to lend to that confusion. If I okay. trust something, trust is different from faith in that uh, faith is a form of trust with a prefix and a suffix added to it. It's a complete faith, or it's a complete trust that is not based on evidence. In other words, if we're just talking about trust, then you can put your trust in in uh, in, in logic, in evident probabilities and past experience, and and you know straight evidence, or you can put your trust in faith. I well, will the, put my trust in faith. The, the biblical definition of faith would be trust. No, it wouldn't. According to Romans one no. eight. And according to what Jesus said to Thomas, you know, you have seen, but blessed, you know, you believe because you have seen, but blessed is he who has not seen 
and but believed. Or if you want to go to Hebrews 11, where it talks about, you know, that faith is, is the, the evidence of things not seen. And we walk by faith, not by sight. So all through the Bible, every reference to faith is a belief that is not based on evidence. It's a complete belief that is not based on evidence. You have to convince yourself thoroughly for no reason. It's the power of pretend. You have to, you have to convince yourself without any evidence to back it up. And more importantly, no amount of evidence will ever change your mind either. What's the evidence that your senses are reliable? As I said, if you want to look into, into scientific application where you, uh, you have the hypothesis that works and the other hypotheses that don't work, we have the hypothesis that you know, your, your senses are providing information that reliably, consistently, constantly verify that there is operations possible under this hypothesis. And then the alternate hypothesis, which you're both proposing now, that our faces are, that our, 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 our uh, senses are meaningless and have no correlation reality at all, is not only constantly disputed, but is completely unsupported. And it wouldn't do your apologetics any good. And I've, I've mentioned, if you've seen any of the debates that I've had with apologists, they always start out with, once I present evidence for my case, there's a rebuttal that you, you know, they, they, they can't defend evidence or they can't fight against evidence. So they question, and I put it this way, in a couple of debates, I said, the position is so weak that in order, the only way for you to be right is for reality to be wrong. And so you're going to argue that reality is wrong. And then usually within two minutes, I get the argument that, all my senses could be giving false information, that reality could be an illusion, that it could be you know, born two weeks ago, magically conceived two weeks ago with a bunch of false memories. That, by definition, is telling me that reality is wrong. But even if the reality was wrong, then your God still doesn't exist because it's based on the Bible, which would be false in that reality. And in my reality, the real reality, your, again, your God does not exist because it's based on the Bible, and the Bible is evidently false in either reality. So whether my, my senses are providing real information or whether they're presenting illusory information, either way, you lose the argument. Okay. But the presuppositional argument doesn't argue for the impossibility of knowing what's real. I'm saying that you do know what's real. The impossibility of knowing what's real? Right. I'm saying that you do know what's real. I'm you you are saying that I do know what's real? Oh, yeah, absolutely. But I'm saying that on your worldview, you have no justification for such knowledge. How how would I not have justification? And why did you distinguish yourself from Cy Ten Brigham if you're going to use the same arguments that he did? Well, I'm not separating myself from Cy. I'm just saying that pre in that part of the discussion, I was saying that presuppositional apologetics goes back further than Cy. You know, it started with uh, Cornelius Van Til, um, several other students out there of Cornelius Van Til. So, as, as we mentioned before, you know, with apologetics being already a dishonest position because it's determined to defend that position well, against any, any and all arguments to the uh, arguments and evidence to the contrary, such that's that even if you're proven wrong, you're still going to maintain that you're right. And then just to make that a bit more dishonest, you then assume that you know that you're right because you believe that you're right and that I know that you're right too. So how much no. more dishonest could that be? No, well, you're talking about proof and evidence, right? Proof presupposes what? Absolute laws of proof logic. Proof doesn't presuppose anything. Well, you'd have to have laws of logic or evaluate proof, right? Okay. Okay. And this what is, is proof just, then? This, so well, proof is, is I, I understand it, the way I, that I use the word proof. Obviously, we're not talking about mathematics here, so we're no. not going to use a mathematical definition. I use the definition that they use in a court of law, where there is an overwhelming preponderance of evidence beyond reasonable doubt. Uh -huh. Yeah, I'm saying that in order to evaluate proof, you need to assume and adhere to absolute laws of logic. Um, you have to have a concept of what truth is. My concept of what truth is, is the truth is what the facts are, whatever we can show to be true. Okay. And you so you, can't, you can't say something is truth if you can't show that it is true. Okay. Is, is truth what corresponds then to what's real? Yeah. But it also, but you have to, so when you, the definition, their standard definition, uh, truth is that which is concordant with reality, which means that reality itself is not truth. It's just statements about reality that can be if they're true. So they can't, we still, again, we can't call it truth until we can show that it's true. Okay. The, the, all right. Just looking at my notes here, I had a couple questions to ask you, but I don't know if they're going to be relevant at this point. Um, 
So how did you come to believe in the Bible in the first place? How did I come to believe? It? Yeah. That's a tough question because I was, I was already raised my whole life knowing the Bible. You know, I was brought up in a church um, learning scripture. So, I mean, I guess. That's, that's sad. I how, do you, it, hmm? how do you reconcile things like the firmament? Well, that's kind of irrelevant to the discussion. Is it? Is it the topic of the discussion. If the, if the Bible makes a plethora of statements that are all demonstrably false, and you're going to hold that the Bible is true despite all these obvious falsehoods, then you have to deal with the obvious falsehoods, do you not? Well, we need to discuss what your standard for determination of what Okay, so the Bible about. describes the, the, everything the Bible describes about the earth in relation to the rest of the cosmos is wrong. I mean, laughably, embarrassingly wrong. But one of them being that these, the description of the earth is a flat disk standing on columns surround, or uh, beneath a giant crystal dome, that the sun and the moon are both lights, that they're both of equal size, that they're both, si that they're both equal in size to each other, uh, that they're both bigger than the stars, that somehow the sun is not a star, the sun is something else, and the stars are all tiny little things that have personalities and can actually come down to the earth to do battle with more than men. So the, the crystal and firmament that has windows in it to let the rain in, for example, is this giant dome, and the sun and the moon and the stars and the clouds are all within the concavity of this, and it's described in the Bible as being solid like molten glass. Now, this is, this is really irrelevant to the topic that we're trying is to Is it? Discuss. You're going to believe that the Bible was written by God. That's right. And, yep. and yet everything it says about the cosmos, I mean, absolutely everything it says in the co about the cosmos is wrong. Well, How so could it be? That's, that's a totally different discussion, because then we're going to discuss hermeneutics. We're going to discuss the way that you execute scripture. And I'm saying that unless you have a basis for rationality in this discussion to begin Which with. Which evidently I do. So no, even, and you're, you're saying that it's we irrelevant. Have not, we have not even gotten into that yet. Okay, well you're saying that it's irrelevant that everything the Bible says is wrong. How can the Bible be truth if nope. everything that it says is wrong? That's not, what it, that's not what I said. I said it's irrelevant to the discussion at this point. because. The okay, so if the Bible not. says a bunch of things about the earth that are all wrong, how is that irrelevant? This is a red herring. I'm, I'm telling you. How is it a red herring? Because you're, you're breaking away from the main topic of the discussion. That is the main topic. No, it You're going to talk about the Bible is the truth, right? Well, everything right. the Bible says is wrong, so how could it be the truth? How is that a red herring? How is that not the topic? Well, your assertion that it's wrong is begging the question. Because we would how? have to get into... It, it, is, there a, is there a firmament, solid, a dome that is solid like molten glass? We're not talking about that right now. We're not talking about that stuff. Okay, why are you dodging that? And why are you telling me that I'm the one changing the subject? I'm, I'm trying to stay on the agreed upon topic for the discussion. Okay, well, the, I'm staying on the agreed upon topic. If you're basing, if you're going to say that the Bible is truth and everything you said, that everything that says is wrong, then how can it be truth? How is that not the topic? Well, I didn't say what the Bible says is wrong. I'm standing on that as my ultimate authority. Right, and how can you do that if everything the Bible says is wrong? Because it's not everything it says is wrong. There's nothing. Even if there's something that it says is right, and I'll give you Ecclesiastes 3, 18 to 21, which contradicts all the rest of the Bible, but it's the only piece of wisdom in the entire book. And everything else is wrong. Are we going to talk about the preconditions for intelligible experience? Uh, I am. That is actually what I'm doing. We, we have the preconditions that you have to have, as I said before, that you have to be able to, in order to say something is truth, you have to be able to show that it is true. And so yeah. you say the Bible is truth and everything it says is wrong. And well, nothing I disagree. that it I says disagree. can be shown to be true. I disagree with your epistemology. Okay. okay. Show me something in the Bible that can be shown to be true. No, I'm saying I don't believe everything can be shown to be true in order to be true. You know, as a okay. Can you, do you believe in something? Well, yeah, the, I know that the answer is obviously yes, but do you believe in something for which nothing that it says can be shown to be true? Hmm. I mean, you can believe in the truth of something that, saying, that Do I believe that has, in something that can't be verified by scientific methodology? Okay, we, have, we have two options with the Aaron, we, have, we have, we have I, things I'm that asking are, your question. I'm answering your yeah. question. Oh, you didn't even hear my question. I, I did, and I'm answering it. 
Okay, go ahead. So we have, we have two options with the Bible. We have things that are not evidently true, and we have things that are evidently not true. Mm -hmm. Does that answer your question? Sure. Okay. Things that are evidently and things that are not evidently. No, things that are e not evidently true, meaning there's no evidence for them, and right. things that are evidently not true, meaning that there's evidence against it. So there is nothing, whatever, in the Bible, in the Quran, in the Bhagavad Gita, in the, in the Kitab i Akdas of Baha'u'llah, in none of them, in none of the religious books, which all claim to be the absolute truth and the infallible word of the one true God and so forth, there's nothing in any of them that can be shown to be any more accurate than any other religious belief. They're all just the myths made of men with no truth to them. <clears throat> okay. I understand that's your position. I don't think you could show that to be true. I can. I'd, I'd be I happy to. And it's the simplest thing to do. I mean, we can get, we can have you, we can have a, we can have a Jew, or we have a, a Muslim and a Sikh, and we can have, you know, present your evidence, boys, mm -hmm. and all of you will pull up, produce butt kiss. Well, I would argue with them on the basis of their presuppositions, just like I'm trying to argue what? with okay. you. You, you guys can go argue your presuppositions all day long, but absolutely none of you can ever answer that question. To show the truth of your position, none of you, well, because there isn't position, any. My position is that the Bible is true. And it's everything it says is false. It and I start and I start the contest with that. I, I contest your position based on, first of all, the rakia, the, the, the firmament. Right. Uh -huh. So just that first of many examples that the Bible is full of things that either can't be verified or have or can't be indicated or vindicated, verified or falsified and things that have already been falsified, things that we've already been proven false. Yeah, I and the firmament that. is just the first and most obvious example. Yeah, I understand your position on it. But like I said, I would have to we'd have to get into we'd basically have to do a Bible study. You know, there's there's a lot of things that Okay. So that's why I started by asking you why you believed in the Bible in the first place. And it seems that you've just simply never questioned it. That I had a huge problem when I first started well, trying to read the Bible. And the firmament was the first stump, stumping block for me because I mean the first thing I'd like I go and ask my parents. I was just a, a kid at the time and I'm like, what is a firmament? Nobody knows. Just ignore it and keep reading. Well, you were, you were raised a Mormon, so they probably didn't really Would it make any difference? Any, absolutely, it would. Okay, it doesn't make but, any difference to you. I'm asking you, and you. it doesn't make any difference to you either. This is because it's irrelevant to the conversation. We're talking yeah, about... It's not. It's, we're, it we're is, talking, we're it is talking need about to be relevant. It's one of the world. many things the Bible says that is absolutely laughably wrong. There is no firmament. We're talking about which world do now? Biblically speaking, the firmament is the same. Okay, okay, so if, okay. If, if you want to ignore, if you want to ignore no, everything the Bible says, then, then I just answered. No, I just answered your question. The firmament. You didn't. I did. You didn't hear me. Okay, answer it. Firmament again. Is, is speaking about the sky. Mm -hmm. and you can't it's speaking wrongly it about the sky. It is giving a completely wrong description. It is giving a description that would have been common for all Asian religions at that time, but still wrong. It's the belief that the Persians already had, that Oriental religions already had, and that the, the Indians already had. The Hindus already believed in the flat disk with the crystal and firmament over it. That was a common belief throughout many religions, and it was wrong. So if God actually created the universe as we know it to be today, then why would his book be full of borrowed falsehoods from other religions from way back when? Yeah, now, if the explanation is that it was written by men who didn't know any better, well, then that makes perfect sense. That, that's a topic for another discussion. Though. Okay. I'm trying to keep it I, to the topic that we agree with. I, I thought I was keeping it to the topic. You tell me what you think the topic is. Well, the agreed upon topic was to discuss which worldview provides for the preconditions for intelligence. That's what I thought I was talking about. If you're going to tell yeah, me that I'm, you have a pre presupposition about that, you, that the Bible is true and everything the Bible says is false, then that would be the topic. Well, I don't. I want to talk about your worldview. We can talk about. We're going to compare the two, obviously. Okay. But, um, I want to know how you, as an atheist, can account for universal concepts such as the laws of logic without appealing to a universal mind. How could you appeal to a universal mind? How do you? Where do you? Where do you add that into the mix? Well, my position is that God can and has revealed Himself. And has revealed certain things to us in such a way that we can have certain knowledge of them. Okay, well, again, uh, whether again, we definitively false, because knowledge is again, demonstrable with measurable accuracy. You measure that? You measure yeah. that? Yeah. How do you measure you, that concept? With tests. 
You can you can show what you know, That's or you a, can't claim that you know it. Well, you just stated it was a philosophical abstract concept oh. by nature. You can't measure that. Yeah, you can. If, if knowledge is justifiable, true information, you can demonstrate that you understand that. If you say that the Bible says X, and I say it doesn't, you can crack it open and show what it actually says, and we can verify what. And, and if you say that it says Y, and it turns out to say X, well, then we verify that your memory or your understanding of it was false. Yeah, right. I think you're, I think you're missing the point there. Your very epistemic position cannot be verified by its own criteria. Okay, and you're going to pretend that pretending that there is a God somehow verifies your position when your position is, in fact, no different than mine. You've just added another element to it and then attributed that to this magic imaginary being, which can't possibly exist. And then you're going to presuppose that, which makes it even worse. So the flaw in your position is based on the premise. What? You're presupposing, which is already a flaw. You're presupposing who? That's the thing. I'm you're not presupposing anything. You're, you're presupposing that your ability to reason is valid, that it's meaningful. Okay, and, you, and, you're, and I'm not presupposing that. I'm analyzing that. This is a position I've come to recently, or I've come to uh, not, not prior to thinking about it. It was after I was thinking about it that I've come to, to, to reason, yes. Are you employing your reason to evaluate your reasoning? Is that what you're doing? <laughs> yes, and I can use objective means to do that. And you and I are in the same situation there. It's just no, that you have added a completely arbitrary and imaginary element unnecessarily, and then you've credited that with things that it can't be credited with. Yeah, that's... So your position is my position, and instead of, instead of relying on your own, which is actually what you're doing, instead of relying on your own reasoning, you're saying that you're relying on your magic imaginary friend, and that he's the one that's providing your reasoning. When in fact, the right. magic imaginary friend doesn't exist, it's an imaginary friend. And you're relying on your own reasoning to justify your reasoning. And unfortunately, between the two of us, I can use objective verification and evidence. You dismiss evidence to a large degree in favor of a presupposition. So again, the flaw is well, built into the premise. Let's slow down a little bit. Because your justification for your reasoning is your own reasoning. And that is viciously circular. Now, if you're right... <laughs> Is, did you quote Saiten, or were you aware that you quoted Saiten on that? Um, it's, it's because good. he says that his position is uh -huh. virtuously circular, and that mine is viciously circular. I, and that, and he said the same thing that you did when he said that you know that, that God has revealed it in such a way that he can know it for certain. And the problem with that, as I illustrated for him, is that he says that God has revealed it to him through the scriptures. And I'm going to assume that since you're quoting Saltan on the rest of this, this is probably going to be the same position that you have. Uh, that, that God has revealed to, through the scriptures to you what he really means. And you know it so well that you know it for certain, even though you can't demonstrate fuck all. I mean, there, there's no part of it that you can show to be true, and there's lots that you can show to be false, but that's all irrelevant, and you're going to believe that it's true regardless of the evidence. And I, and I bring up to him uh, Sir Isaac Newton, arguably the smartest person who ever lived, although embarrassingly he was also a creationist because he was in the 1700s. But Sir Isaac Newton de uh, declared very much exactly the same thing as Saiten Bruden kicked it, that God revealed himself through scriptures in such a way that he could know it for certain. And he was very, very explicit about the particular thing that God revealed to him, and that God revealed it to Newton, to Sir Isaac Newton, in such a way that he would know it better than yeah, any heard. other person. Are you familiar with this quote? I've heard your spiel on it before. Okay. Uh, so Sir yeah. Isaac Newton is aware that because God has revealed himself through the scriptures, that, you know, Sir Isaac Newton reads the scriptures and he reveals the word of God, to, and he has a better understanding, chosen by God to have a better understanding than any other human. And he understands that Jesus is not an incarnation of God. Okay. Which, of course, Saiten and I presumably you would hold an opposite position. So here we have two people, both presuppositionless, both claiming that God has revealed opposite information mutually contradictory opposite information in such a way that they can both know it for certain when certainly both of them, one of them, at mm -hmm. least, at a minimum, absolutely has to be wrong, and the possibility really exists that both of them are most are almost definitely wrong. And for my position, of course, both of them are wrong. 
Well, if we're going to talk about how God reveals himself. Yeah, if since neither one can actually verify that they're right, and actually Newton's got a better better option than than uh, than Sautin Brugnicke because the scriptures actually do bear out his argument better than they do his or presumably yours. But that doesn't matter because neither still neither it's just an interpretation of, of folklore. There's still no way to show that either of you are right that there even is a God. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, there again, you know, my position is that the proof that the Bible is true is that if it wasn't, you couldn't prove anything at all. And that's what I'm trying to get. And if there, if there is no God, then I can still prove any number of things. For example, I'm, I'm doing research on, uh, on a series. I'm doing uh, explaining evolution through, uh, through clades. I'm director of the Phylogeny Explorer Project that I'm trying to promote. So mm -hmm. I classify you know, humanity and all of the different evolutionary clades that we've descended through. And it's an easy enough thing to prove that you are all of these different evolutionary clades. You know, uh, deuterostome, vertebrate, uh, uh, amniote, and so forth. You know, right up to and including monkey and ape. Now, it's easy enough to prove all of these things. Your God's existence or non-existence is irrelevant in either case. Whether, if, whether your God exists or not is irrelevant to the whole situation. The Bible is still the myths of men, and evolution is still an inescapable fact of population genetics either way. Okay. Now, how does your God enable or prohibit any discussion? I'm saying that God is the necessary precondition. Okay, so you imagine that your God is a precondition, which he's not. There's, there's, no, there's no reason to believe that there is a God. There's many reasons to believe there's not a God. And there's nothing that your God can contribute to logic other than what you want to arbitrarily attribute to you. You take, you take your reasoning to justify your reasoning, as obviously Sir Isaac Newton was doing. It's his, his interpretation of Scripture. Uh, Saitan Bruggenkate's interpretation of Scripture. Neither man realizes that they're only using their own reasoning to justify their reasoning because they both erroneously attribute God. That God has told them this, he can't have. They can't both be right. So neither one is. No, they can't both be right. And that's Right, so neither one well, is. Well, that's that's a logical leap right there. It's, it's how could well, how, okay? How yeah. could either one, either one, have said that God has revealed it through the scriptures in such a way that they could know it for certain if they're both reading the same scriptures? Well, like you said, it's, it's a difference of interpretation. Exactly, you're using your own reasoning to justify your reasoning. But you, but you want to compare everything with scripture. Now, do I? Scripture is irrelevant. Scripture is man-made mythology with no truth in it. So I don't need to compare everything with Scripture. Well, in order you do, argument. because you want to know your argument depends on that. Mine doesn't. All I have to do is point out that your Scriptures are wrong about everything they say. Mm -hmm. And that all of the apologists are wrong on several different points, not just evidentially, but also logically. Okay. That there is no basis or foundation to your position whatsoever. There's literally no defense of it. Well, I think I haven't gotten a chance to really get into it. If I had okay. a dollar for every time I get interrupted, I'd have at least 20 bucks. Oh, okay. I know what I'm trying to ask you is how you appeal to or how you can account for immaterial, universal, invariant laws of logic on your worldview where you're nothing but a, you know, biological if bag of stuff i mean you're okay so so the problem is that you, you have this uh, this notion that we have to have a purpose to life no that's got nothing to do i'm asking you about the laws of so right why now. is why is it then that there's any criticism against being a biological organism why do you say that we have to just be a bag no, of chemicals not the criticism the criticism is is that in light of your worldview and then tell me if i'm wrong but our thoughts are nothing more than biological electrochemical responses which are determined or acting in accordance to fixed laws of chemistry is that or is that not the case i don't like to use the word just bag of chemicals because it is demonstrably a fact that we are a bag of chemicals correct regardless your worldview even if your worldview was correct we'd still be a bag of chemicals right but not but not just right and, and in my worldview we're not just a bag of chemicals either well okay so but I mean, when you, you say know. nothing more than, well, there's a great deal of aesthetics that you can apply to what you're calling nothing more than. So again, it's a criticism that without your God, there is no value to life. 
no, no. My position is, is that without God, and, and I'm talking about logic here, you can't have objective. Well, but God is without logic. That's how I exist. That, that God exists without logic. I'm saying that logic can only is, exist without logic. logic is rooted in the mind of God. And that we, but the mind of God is disembodied, which by definition cannot logically exist. Because you cannot, by definition, can't have a disembodied mind since a mind is a product of a brain. So it can't be disembodied. Well, and it's not even in your scripture. If you go back in your scripture far enough, God walks, talks, eats, drinks. Uh, well, I don't know about drinks, but he, he walks, talks, and eats, and sits, and waves his hand, and turns his backside, and cheats at wrestling, and he does all of these human things. Yeah. He showed up at Abraham's door. You know, Abraham opens the door, and there's three guys standing there. He recognizes one of them as God. The other two guys wander off to Sodom, and the third guy who's still there goes and sits with him under a tree. Right? Mm -hmm. And there's even the conversation where he draws close to God, and then he wanders away from God to go get something, and then God starts talking to himself. Right? I mean, and uh, the Christians will twist around that you know, God is just a spiritual form, but the Bible describes it as being a guy, visible, tangible, eating, sitting, talking, and then and, and the, you know, Abraham walks away from him, and then he's, you know, and the God is talking to himself, and then Abraham draws close to him to say something else. There's a, there's a guy there. It's there's the guy again. who knocked, and there's the three guys standing there. The there story again. contradicts the interpretation. There again, you, you need to understand theology you need to understand hermeneutics maybe i do theology. understand theology and what they're doing is trying to make up excuses to cover up a hole the bible no. does say there's no. three guys standing at the door right yes yep. and that okay. abraham drew near to one after the other two left there's one still standing there yeah there's so, God can, and they go can, and they eat together yeah. god can right? manifest himself in different ways but he never so himself now you're God. saying that god is a man when he wants to be and so there's a contradiction there. So Abraham saw God, right? He opens the door, there's God. You've got, right? Right? Well, it's a, it's a manifestation of God. Okay. You know, so he opens the door, and there's a manifestation of God with manifestations of two other guys, and the two other guys will manifest again, themselves over in Sodom. There right? again, this is completely off topic. How do you, as an atheist, account for the existence of universal, unchanging, immaterial laws of logic? How do you account for okay, the let's, let's take on the next thing. So you, you want to say that they're immaterial. So they concepts are. so concepts are immaterial. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay, so you, you, we have a concept. We have like a political party, which is arguably immaterial, right? Any number of concepts could be said to be immaterial. Does that imply that supernatural or invisible magical beings exist? No, no, I'm talking okay. about... So, so mathematics, for example, the idea of numerals, right? When we uh -huh. when we base our, our our math system on you know base ten, right? We we know that you can take one object and put in another object, and you've got two objects. But the fact that we base our our math on ten is primarily because we have ten fingers, so it's arbitrary, and so our math is uh, is uh, immaterial. Yet it's also verifiable. And does that imply that magical beings exist? I would say that laws of mathematics, the concept of numbers, are also rooted in the mind of God, just like the which clearly they're not. I mean, you just you've just added the unnecessary God component. You you and I are in the same position. You've just added a God. So you're using your reasoning to justify your reasoning, but you're pretending that you're attributing it to this other character that doesn't exist. No, I'm not pretending. That's what I'm actually doing. You are literally that. pretending. I'm That's what that. faith is. It's I'm pretending to know what you don't know that is being convinced of things for which there is no evidence. That is literally the power of pretend. It is, honestly, it's make-believe. Hmm. Okay. Let's check my notes real quick and see if I have any other questions. All right. Now, I kind of really want to stick to this law of logic thing. I don't feel like you've answered the question. These are Okay, so you want me to prove something without a God? I want you to tell me how, on your worldview, you can have universal concepts without appealing to universal. What makes a concept mind. universal? God. But I'm asking you. Okay, so then there's no such thing as a universal concept then? 
Right, right. I would say okay, that. So there's without, no such thing as universal concept. I would gotcha. say without revelation from God, you could not have universal concept. Okay, so since there is no God, there's no universal concept either. That's your position. Well, you can't define it without there being an without an imaginary construct to base it on. So if you don't have a definition that is independent of the imaginary construct, then it's imaginary. There clearly is no universal con uh, there's no universal concept if you can't explain what makes it a universal concept without imagining a god well i'm, I'm saying that the laws of logic are rooted in the mind of god okay god so the, you're saying that there's no yes. logic laws of logic either because again if you can't define it separate from your god then how do we know it exists i'm not sure i understand your question you're okay right okay um i don't know how to paraphrase this uh, in, in a debate I had a year or so ago, guys arguing about whether God is a source of all that is good. Mm -hmm. So we have to come up with a definition of good. And he says, good is whatever is consistent with God. Well, mm -hmm. then, if we have to argue that, that you know, whether, whether God is a source of good, if there is no God, then there is no good, right? If we can't define what good is separate from God, then if God doesn't exist, then it's not separate from God, then it goes right along with him. It's an it's imagination land with him. We need a definition that is independent of God. Now, I have a definition of good that is independent of God, and the unfortunate thing about that is, is that God can't measure up to that independent definition. So if you can tell me what makes a universal concept and not base it on God, then we can determine, then, then on my, from my worldview, I can explain what a universal concept is or where it comes from. But if you can't define it separate from God, then it doesn't exist, just like your God. That that's assuming that God doesn't exist, though. I mean, that's I I can't God assume doesn't. otherwise. Do you assume the leprechauns don't exist? Oh, absolutely. I'm an a leprechaunist. But okay, why I'm talking about why? Well, why would I believe in leprechauns? Exactly. Okay. But exactly. Ahead, it's not just that there's no evidence for them, is it? I mean, it is, you could say that you don't believe in leprechauns simply because there's no evidence for them, but more than that, you can also say that there's no possibility of leprechauns, and you can do that for multiple reasons. One, because we know that the way that the synapses fire in the mind, we know that the brain, that the body cannot be shrunk, a human cannot be shrunk to six inches tall and still function. There's no way to do that. Our mm -hmm. physiognomy would have to be dramatically changed, and our brains would not, could not work the same way. Then there's the whole magic thing, which throws everything off. And, he, and with, with God, we have all the same problems that we have with leprechauns, mm -hmm. you know, compounded to make it even worse than leprechauns. So it's not possible for me to believe in God. It is easily, at least as imaginary, and just as absurd as leprechauns. Okay. No, not no. just because there's no evidence of, of them, but because there's substantial evidence against them. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I so, really what makes a that... universal concept universal? In, in that it applies everywhere. Okay, give me an and example. Variant, and that it doesn't, well, the laws of logic would be an example. Okay. So, we say that we're, we're, we're talking about laws of logic that are not not constrained by culture, right? Right, I can't think of okay. an example of law of logic so, that would right. not constrained by culture. Either. Exactly. So, we, we have things that we've determined to be just as certain as, say, with mathematics, right? Yeah, yeah. So there, there are concepts that we've determined, just like with laws of nature, you know, uh, when with Newton's laws of motion, you know, he got some of them right. right? Even, though, even though his theory was wrong, he still managed to get the laws of nature right, some of them, at least the laws of motion. So we've established certain things to be true Regardless, just like with his laws of motion, we calculate mathematically, we put in a summary statement, the laws of, of uh, you know, how things function. Like with evolution, for example, there's a number of laws that I could cite. Uh, one of them being, and I think I might be the first one to ever actually verbalize this, that the, the, uh, the, the two closely related species, the, the young of two closely related species resemble each other more than the adults do, because you know that's an evolutionary pattern, which also qualifies as a law. So we determine certain laws of nature just like we would determine mathematics and we determine laws of logic. Yes? And these are things that we've worked out using right. our reasoning to justify our reasoning. And then you have arbitrarily imagined a God character that cannot logically exist. No, no, no. Like I said, my position starts with God. I'm saying that the laws no, of logic... No, it really doesn't. Hold on there. Hold on, you're about to interrupt. It really doesn't. Again. Dude. You you started with a different position, and then you adopted presuppositionalism, which kind of negates the presupposition. It's not a presupposition. 
It is literally logic. pretend. It's a make-believe position. Okay. Are the laws of logic presuppositions? No. They had to be determined. Right. And they're not applicable to everybody. It's a strange thing. I, I was uh, I was in a tutorial class for uh, physics. In this discussion. Huh? I said I don't what? know if they're applicable in this discussion. I'm trying to, I'm trying well, to I'm working you. with an apologist, so they will be limited. But I was oh, I was in sorry. a uh, I was in a I was in a tutorial class for physics, and there was somebody else that was taking a tutorial there for logic, and I hadn't taken a logic class. I wish that I had. But the questions that they were asking this girl. I couldn't believe she was getting these things wrong. How do you get these things wrong? It's so obvious. It was like you know questions along the lines of, you know, uh, uh, if uh, if all if all ducks excuse me if all birds are ducks then are are all birds excuse me if all ducks are birds then are all birds ducks? And she couldn't get that. You know, what the hell? It, it, these are not things we need a god to determine. You know we, we understand you know the subsets within parent sets things like this. It was every question that, they, that the tutor asked, and she couldn't get any of them, and had to have each of these things explained to her. That was mystifying to me. I would love to go back and take a logic class just because of how amazingly easy it would be. And just if, if they could do it, where they, everybody has to give an oral answer, because I want to hear how stupid everybody else in the class is. To see that anybody could fail a logic class dumbfounds me. Mm -hmm. So not everybody's reasoning is valid then. Correct? Apparently not. Okay, how do you know that yours is? And that's, you know, alluding back to the earlier question. Because I can justify that the things that I say are correct. Okay. I wouldn't assert something is true unless I can show that it is true. There again, now, right. you have asserted that your God is the root of all these other things. You can't demonstrate that, so you've broken my rule. You have well, asserted empty, baseless speculation as though it were a matter of fact, as if it was something you could demonstrate. You can't begin to demonstrate that. That means that it is a lie. It is a false statement. I don't think we've gotten into the actual... Well, you did say that God is the root of all logic, which is not demonstrably correct. There's no way you can demonstrate any part of that. It is an empty, baseless, unsupported speculation asserted as if it were fact. It's what? pretending to know things you don't know. Be, it's just like what Peter Bogosian said faith is, pretending to know what you don't know. Okay. So, and you're going to question my logic. No, I'm going to question your ability to account for it, and I don't think you've done that yet. Uh, obviously, I've done better than you. Because well, you've made every time I get an opportunity to speak, you kind of interrupt me. And, okay, and I was kind of warned that that would happen. I mean, I was warned that that would happen. So, How long do I need to remain silent? <laughs> I mean, I wait till you ask, you ask a question, I answer yeah. it. Yeah. If you make a false statement, then yeah, I jump into it, especially if you're going to be, if, you, if your premise is false and you're headed for a conclusion, do I need to let you get all the way to the conclusion if the premise is false? We are talking about logic, right? Yes, I do want to talk about logic. I just Okay, so if you start with a false that. premise, do I need to let you get to the conclusion first, or do I need to let you say the whole thing and then say, well, the last 15 minutes was useless because your premise was wrong? I just want to get into how you account for the existence of these laws. I'm saying that the Christian worldview makes sense. Of you understand laws, what a law is. You did it right? again. You did it again. I'm you saying what? that. You asked me a question. I'm answering. Did you not ask, ask me a question just now? No, I was explaining my position. Okay. That the laws of logic are rooted in the mind of God, that the Christian worldview and universal truths, such as the laws of logic, comport with one another. I'm asking you. On your worldview, or just biological bags of stuff whose ancestors are fish, and our thoughts are chemically determined happenstances, how you can account for laws of logic, absolute standards for reasoning. That's the same way I about. just did, and will do again, and will point out again that you did not justify your position. You have added an arbitrary element without any justification, and then falsely asserted a fact statement based on that, which is not a fact, where you have attributed this, this ability to this thing that this thing can't have because this thing doesn't exist and it wouldn't attribute it anyway and wouldn't change the fact anyway. The laws of nature, and I'm going to put mathematics and I'm going to put the laws of logic in there, these are things that we determine, that we determine about the way that the world works. We recognize. We don't need, we don't need a magical anthropomorphic immortal to determine any of these things. Now, you're going to say arbitrarily that you have that, 
and you're going to use that to mask the fact that you use your reasoning to justify your reasoning just as I do, but instead of going with evidence and going with objective verification as I do, you simply use a presupposition. So you fail in the premise to defend your position, which you're going to tell me that I haven't defended my position when I have and you have not. Okay. Well, I'm trying to think of how else I can approach this here. I still don't feel like you've answered the question. I mean, you're just kind of saying that we recognize these things. And that's basically what you're saying. We determine these things to be true. We recognize Okay, them. so when you find up that set of footprints on the beach and you pull up your boat, as I mentioned before in the first hypothetical, okay. how do you verify that those are footprints? Well, I'm going to ask you, how do you verify that the laws of logic... You, do you determine are, that they are footprints? How do you determine that? What? Is it because you recognize what footprints of Nike shoes look like? Is it because they're, they're in alternating feet? Is it because they're all consistent with each other? These are how we determine. These are the laws. Of, this is how we determine the laws of logic. This is how we determine mathematics with consistent verification. Are the laws of logic descriptive or prescriptive? Does it matter? Yes, it matters. Okay. I have no idea. Okay. You tell me how it matters. Well, it matters because it has everything to do with whether or not they're going to be the same tomorrow as they are today. I mean, if they're descriptive mm -hmm. and they're merely just derived from our descriptions of what we observe in reality, then that makes them contingent upon what's real or upon reality or what, we or what, what we're observing. Okay, so, so the, footprints, would... the footprints on the beach, are they descriptive or prescriptive? Well, the footprints would be descriptive. What we deduce about the, the footprints would be What do you do deduce about the footprints? I'm just saying that our, our, what we would deduce about those footprints would be prescriptive. Okay, what do you we, deduce we about those footprints? What, what do I deduce? Well, that they're there, <laughs> you know. Okay, um, so you, you verify that those are footprints and you you, right, you right. okay right. I would have and so it's the same it. thing as the way we verify you know if with mathematics we can do continuous constant tests everybody in the world for all time can you test it forever and we can we can't we can't why not you can't test them the same way that you would why not material because they're conceptual in fact you can't even so I just gave you an example I just gave you an example of you know of of the girl in the logic class where every question is yeah these are things we can be we can definitely determine whether uh -huh. you know yeah, just just because you know all ducks are birds does not mean that all birds are ducks you know and right. this it's just too easy to demonstrate yes we certainly can demonstrate these things right give me an example that. of something we can't demonstrate or know without your god everything okay so i can't know that all ducks are birds and simultaneously, I cannot know that all birds are not ducks the without your God. The beginning of the fear of the Lord I, I would have to Lord. have a God to know that a subset of a larger set is not the larger set. That A, that a equals A, but A does not equal B. I need a God to know that. That's right. That's right. So you exist. How? In Show me. Show me how you know that. By and through revelation. Okay, so you don't know that. It's the same way you know everything. It's the same I way can you demonstrate know that what I say is correct. You assert empty, baseless, unjustified, unsupported speculations falsely as if they were fact when you know they are not fact. So you lie and tell me that I can't know anything when I clearly know things without your God, and your God has nothing to do with it. Your God prevents you from knowing things. That's why you have to make false statements, like that you just assert whatever you want to believe for no other reason than you want to believe it, and you can't demonstrate your knowledge to any degree at all, by any means whatsoever. So you clearly do not know what you pretend to know. Faith is pretending to know what you don't know. That's not faith. I mean, that is not 
that is clearly fake. Have you seen Pagosian's presentation on it? That's what you're demonstrating, what you have been demonstrating. You've been pretending to know things you don't know for an hour in this conversation with me. No, 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 no. You pretended to know that there is a God. You pretended to know that Scripture is true, even though everything that the Bible says about the earth in relation to the rest of the cosmos is wrong, and most of the rest of the stuff that the Bible says is wrong. You, you insist that, that your God is the source of all things, and I can't know anything without your God, even though I can prove that I know things without your God. So it doesn't make any difference. You're going to hold to a position. You're going to defend a position against all evidence and ev evidence and arguments against it. It doesn't matter if you're proven wrong. You're still going to hold that position. So it's dishonest. And so you're going to lie to assert things. You pretend to know things you don't know. It's claiming facts that are not facts. Again, okay. dishonest. Yeah, and you're going to question like, whether I can know things. I still feel like as long as we've been talking, we really haven't gotten into the discussion. yet. Haven't we? We've demonstrated no, that there's so. no truth to your position whatsoever, but there are a whole lot of lies, and that your position is, in fact, based on lies. I'm saying that Christianity can be proven true by virtue of the impossibility of the contrary. All right, okay, the okay, so you want to tell me there's an impossibility of the contrary? Yeah, what I'm, is saying the, it's what is the, for, I'm saying it's impossible for your worldview to provide for the preconditions of intelligible experience that you just assume and take for granted in order to know anything at all. I asked you why your reasoning is valid. You appeal to your reasoning in order to justify the validity. As of you do also. You just add an like, arbitrary element to it. No, I'm saying that God justifies the validity. Right. You make an empty assertion right. without any basis or justification, something you can't actually know and can't verify at all. So you've lied. When you say verify, and, though, are you yeah. talking about empirical methodology? Yes, when I tell you that uh, that all birds, uh, that, that all ducks are birds, for example, we can prove that. When I can say that you know, not all birds are ducks, we can prove that too. Your God is irrelevant in either case. Whatever I want to demonstrate that I know, I can show you that I know regardless of your God. And despite your God, you can't show me that you know anything. I'm saying that you can't even show yourself that your reasoning is valid without appealing to your own but, reasoning. And that is but that's what you're doing as well. We are both appealing to our reasoning because that's no, all we I'm, have. And so I'm, I'm going through with you. I'm appealing to earth. scripture. I'm appealing to scripture as a basis for my Right. Reasoning. You're appealing to something that is absolutely it's, false. We are. And that's so your and that's your criteria. So you've based a book of lies. You, you're telling lies based on a book of lies, and that's your grounding point. And you are using your reasoning to justify your reasoning, and your reasoning is seriously flawed. But then you're going to just question whether I can justify myself. You have not justified yourself, and I have. I can actually show that the things I know, I actually do know. You can't show that anything you know, you say you know, that you actually know, or that any of it is true. You see, you talk a lot about truths, but you can't show that any of them are true. Well, the thing is, is that in this in this discussion. You're actually showing me that my worldview is true because you're actually borrowing from it. I'm not borrowing from your worldview. You are borrowing from mine and means, adding the arbitrary means, God character. By all means, account for the existence of the laws of logic. You still haven't done that. Uh, yes, still... I have repeatedly, and I think we're done. Because we've now repeated ourselves three times. And we can repeat ourselves two dozen more times, and then you'll just tell me after I answer the question, you'll tell me I haven't answered it again. I'll answer it again, and you tell me you haven't answered it again, I think we're done. Okay? I want to thank you for being on, and uh, I'll give you the last word. Um, well, I want to thank you for, uh, you know, giving me the opportunity to have this discussion with you. Yeah. It's too bad that we couldn't get any further than what we did, um, you know. I don't know how much further you can get into it. We're, we're, in, a, we're in a holding pattern, and if you're never going to concede your error, well, I guess we're is, done. The thing is, it's not my job to persuade you that my position is true. You don't have to. I, I know. Then I'm just letting you know. That you're that you're challenging me to justify myself. I justify myself. I return the favor, challenge you. You refuse, and then tell me that I didn't answer the question. We, we can continue the circling pattern forever, and then you're going to blame me for not getting any deeper. I don't think you have any deeper to go. I think your, all of your conclusions are based on false premises. I think that we've demonstrated that. You've got a number of false premises, and you're trying to project them onto me. And I'm not going to wear them. Mm -hmm. so, thank you for being on.
Thank you.